Bonjour Montréal, comment ça va? <laughs> This is going to be in English, sorry. <laughs> so for those who have never heard of Swift Jitter, the easiest way to describe it is that it's a software renderer. Now I think that's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, we are targeting the CPU for rendering and we're using the CPU to its fullest, using all of its cores, all of its vector instructions and all of the special instructions that make sense for graphics. And the GPU also runs software, so there's not that much difference anymore between the two. Also, if you follow the subgroups uh, uh, discussion, that's just exposing all of the vector operations that uh, are on the GPU. On the CPU, they've been available all along. So, <coughs> SwiftJitter has a, a long history before uh, it became a Google project, um, but it, it really made sense for Google to uh, to use it, uh, first of all, for WebGL. For the web, we need uh, 3D to work everywhere. You want to be able to go to a website, not worry about what hardware you're running, and you need to be able to see the content. <coughs> so um, that's how we became a Google project. And then uh, we ported it to Android, where uh, primarily it is being used for uh, the Android Studio. Uh, so a developer who has maybe outdated hardware can also use Swift Jitter as the OpenGL ES, uh, driver. Um, so you can go to Android Studio and switch explicitly to Swift Jitter, or it will automatically switch to Swift Jitter if uh, your GPU is not capable enough. Um, and there's some other projects there that to some degree use Swift Jitter mainly for testing. Um, so going back to this, Google's mission, you're all aware, uh, is to organize the world's information, but it needs to be universally accessible. And the useful part means it needs to be fast enough. And so SwiftJitter tries to be as fast as possible on the CPU when you need it as a fallback. So where do we stand today? We fully support OpenGL ES3. Um, for the DQP test suite, we will be submitting to the, uh, the Vulkan, uh, sorry, to the uh, Kronos uh, uh, suite soon, so we get fully ratified. Um, we support all the major platforms now. OpenGL, uh, sorry, Chrome OS is coming uh, soon-ish. And uh, we recently also added ARM support, so you can run it on actual Android devices. One of the use cases is we, we run it on uh, Android Things. Um, so some devices have uh, really old GPUs or really uh, drivers that can't pass the Android uh, requirements. So that's where we run SwiftJitter instead. Um, and stuff like uh, a watch, it doesn't really have a big need for powerful 3D, but um, you can save the cost of a GPU by running SwiftJitter. So a little bit about how it actually works and how we try to make it as fast as possible. So the application just talks to a DLL um, or a .so on Linux or other platforms. And uh, first we have the API layer in SwiftJitter, which is very similar to what Jamie just explained in Angle, which is no coincidence because the pr two projects have a, a little bit of shared history there. Um, the renderer takes all of the draw commands from the API layer and uh, splits it over multiple threads and generates the exact code that we need for a specific draw call to be executed. And that's really one of the biggest tricks that we use to make it fast. We just only use the operations uh, that are needed to perform the draw call that you are currently executing. Um, so how does that work, generating code uh, on the fly at runtime? Um, sounds complicated, you need compiler technology for this, yes, but we abstracted it into a language that is integrated into C++. So here you have a, a little example, we call this the reactor language, and the if statement with a capital I is actually a dynamic if that doesn't execute when you execute this, but it just records what you want to do later. Um, likewise, the, the float at the top has a capital F. Uh, this just records the operations that you want to do later. So um, the first if that you see in this example is what you know in C++ as a, a, a static compile time if. Um, it, 
you set it once and it determines uh, what code you're generating at static compile time. But for reactor, your regular if statements, the second one you see in this example, become this kind of uh, compile time uh, directive. So you can control very easily with normal if statements in C++ which code you're generating for your uh, processing routines. And uh, only the third if there is an actual dynamic if that is going to execute after running this to record what you want to generate. And then finally, once we have uh, the list of operations that we actually want to execute, we send it to a, a JIT compiler, uh, either LLVM or Sub-Zero, which is a more lightweight version that ships with uh, Chrome currently. And then we execute that on the CPU. So that's where we stand today. Where do we want to go? We want to implement Vulkan. Um, and ultimately, I think it makes sense that we're going to use the Angle project to, to keep supporting OpenGLES. But uh, internally, Swift Jitter will become entirely Vulkan only. <coughs> so currently on the left, you see the current architecture again. And we use OpenGLES API layer and GLSL to an internal assembly representation. Now, with Falcon, we would be ingesting uh, SPUR-V. And we can do an intermediate step where we take SPUR-V as the intermediate uh, representation for an OpenGLES implementation. So that's one way that we can mitigate some of the risks of moving over to the new architecture. Um, the other thing to consider is that currently we have a really monolithic context. Uh, it's very uh, OpenGL-like where you set all of the state with OpenGL, and then you fire it off to do a draw call, and then you set all of the state again in your context, and then fire off a draw call. Um, we want to become more Vulkan-like, so that means splitting these uh, state objects up into the, the respective pipeline stages. Um, also, currently, we only generate 128-bit uh, vector operations. We want to widen that to 256 and 512-bit uh, instructions that are currently available on the newest CPUs. Um, and then finally, um, we currently rasterize by doing scan lines and, and splitting these between different CPU cores. Um, that has worked reasonably well so far for up to four to eight cores, maybe. Um, but we, we want to do tile-based rendering to make it more efficient and to make use of the CPU's uh, cache more efficiently. Um, so it's important to, to see that we can move from the left to the right in different stages uh, and, and mitigate some of the risk. Um, angle for Vulcan is not entirely ready yet, so this can evolve in, in parts. So ultimately, I think this is what we want the world to look like, uh, at least from Google's perspective. Uh, if you're targeting Android, you would be talking either directly to Vulkan or preferably to uh, the Angle implementation of OpenGL ES. And if you're targeting the web, today we have uh, WebGL, which is based entirely on OpenGL ES. Um, but the new way to do it will be through WebGPU. That's currently an API uh, in development. That's going to be implemented by uh, a library that we're implementing at Google as well that, is, that can target either Vulkan, Metal, or DirectX 12, all the major uh, next generation APIs. And all of these use cases will be either testable or have a fallback with Swift Jitter. So um, why does it make sense to, uh, to have Swift Jitter uh, in the cloud and stuff? Well, we also have a product called Cloud Android. And currently, it only renders with uh, Swift Jitter. And the reason for that is that it costs hundreds of uh, dollars to, to have a, a server with a GPU in it per month. Uh, but we can have uh, servers with CPUs for just a couple of dollars per month. So that makes a really good big difference. And for a use case like rendering Android, the, the workload is low enough that you can do it through Swift Jitter. Uh, but we can actually hopefully scale it up to very high uh, performance as well. Um, today we have 48 core CPUs uh, running with AVX 512 that could do up to six teraflops of, uh, of computational power. So that's really approaching where the GPUs are today. Um, and 
there's no limits on the kind of uh, API features that you can have there. Um, the other thing is we found that uh, when you do conformance testing, it's almost as fast to run it on the CPU versus on the GPU because you're just sending off little, little, rendering, sorry, little rendering tasks to the GPU, and the GPU would spin up all of its vector units and then have to send it back over the PCI bus and make it readable to the CPU for testing whether these results are correct. It's easier to just stay on the CPU and if you have a big data center, you can parallelize this process uh, a great deal uh, and do it cheaply. So um, Swifter is also, we're gonna make it a, a sort of a reference implementation of Falcon, hopefully, and this will have many uh, advantages to hopefully the uh, Falcon ecosystem as a whole. Um, one of the things you can do with it is instrument it with address annotation, uh, memory sanitation, uh, undefined behavior sanitation, all these things that you can't, or is much more difficult to get with a GPU implementation. Um, so with that instrumentation turned on, you can do fuzzing, which means having tests uh, vary by themselves and find bugs for you. Once a bug is found, you need to be able to reproduce it. Well, with a reference implementation that runs virtually everywhere and produces the exact same result everywhere, that should be an easy thing to do. And also, Swift Shader can be used for actual debugging of the shaders. Um, so all of this is reinforcing uh, finding stuff that breaks and having tests for it that will improve the entire ecosystem, also for the hardware side of things. So, um, we're going to get started on the Vulkan implementation real, relatively soon, uh, but we're still uh, trying to collect some, some information about what is the right thing to do. Um, there are some trade-offs to be made. For example, we can just write a lowest common denominator, just something that might pass the Vulkan uh, uh, CTS and that's it. Or we can make it uh, a super big thing that can support all the things. Uh, what we probably want is something in the middle. Uh, we're fairly mobile oriented with, with Android and the web is also uh, the, the lower end of things. Um, but still, uh, you know, there's all these different uh, things in Vulkan that are configurable. Uh, to what degree do we want to make Swift here also uh, be able to, to be reconfigured to test these different kind of uh, devices. Um, also the debugging and profiling uh, features might have a performance impact. I don't think they have to, but uh, we want to be sure that uh, we, hit, we hit the right balance there. Uh, and also, these are the Google priorities. There might also be interest from uh, the wider uh, industry, from Vulkan, uh, from uh, Kronos, uh, and I'd love to learn about these if there are any. So with that, uh, any questions? I said so, all the things. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think one of the questions we do have um, uh, from feedback from developers is the need for a reference implementation and really understanding how it will be used is something we're, we're discussing in the working group and understanding what the requirements are for developers in terms of testing using reference implementation yeah. is key. Yeah, at, at Google we're very eager to use Vulkan. It has a lot of advantages for efficiency and performance. Um, but it's also very fragile, uh, so we need a reference implementation to do all of these uh, re self-reinforcing testing uh, scenarios. So on DX12, um, there's a warp, and yep. uh, there's a lot of uh, positive things said about it. I was wondering if you have any aspirations towards something like that for Vulkan? Yeah, Swift uh we're hoping will become the, the equivalent of warp uh, for Vulkan and hopefully faster than Warp. Uh, the last version of Swift Shader that supported uh, DirectX was uh, a bit faster than Warp, um, but it's been a while since I've tested that. Mm -hmm.